So who's your chair? We're chairless. We're chairless at right now. I see. And and uh, I didn't get organized enough to look and see if there's an agenda for today's meeting. Is there one? <laughs> there, is, there is, but we don't have. A okay, I'm starting to get the picture. Never mind. Sorry. Just We've carry had on. An agenda for two years. <laughs> it's the same one every mail is mail is exactly the same. Except today we actually have something new on it. This is the first one that's had something additional on it. So. Don't don't keep me in suspense. I don't know what it is because I'm on the computer, so I can't read it. Well, it, does, it doesn't look like we're possibly going to have form. I still have a few slides. I can show you some updated uh, data from the complaints and some of the uh, recent stuff that we've got. Uh, and then we can talk about, you know, just what we have on the agenda. Uh, we don't have to have actually uh, hold a meeting. Uh, it's up to you guys. Well, I want to know why we don't have an enforcement officer yet. Because we're doing a background check. I read that. I read that too. <laughs> but how long does it take to do a background check? At our last meeting, we were supposed to be hiring one. Unless background checks for these guys are a lot different than they are for teachers, etc. It doesn't take months to do a background. No, I, it took a week. I wonder if that one fell through and they're hiring somebody else. No, I don't think so. I think it just is what uh, you can ask chief about, but that's, that's how long it takes for police officers. So. And is the, is the um, enforcement officer an actual police officer? Uh, is the, no. No, 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 no. So they're not a police officer. So what are, what is, what are they exactly? What's their. You, you, see, you can ask, you can ask chief. You, yeah, I can't answer these questions. <laughs> So, so is, is he going to be at this meeting? No, he's not at this meeting. <laughs> so again, we are in the same situation we've been for weeks on and every single meeting where we can't get to talk to anybody about enforcement. And that's like a main issue. You know, you can still call the chief and talk about enforcement. I, I will understand why you I, came there. I will tell you, though, there was a house on Lark. Is it Larch? It's right behind the bookstore um, that had a big sign up, an industrial sign, a motel sign. And so I called chief. They get, had 30 days to take it down. I waited another 30 days and called back and they said it was taken care of. So they are doing, they're doing some things that I've asked them to look into, but they're passing it around from officer to officer. Whoever's on duty gets it. But the... Well, can I ask a question? Sorry, Lisa. Would, would the people who are sitting at the table identify yourselves? I have no idea who, who else is in this meeting. So uh, I'm Jeff Adams. I'm Community Development Director. Okay. I'm Robert St. Clair, uh, Planner. I'm Katie Hillenhagen. I'm the Administrative Assistant for Building and Planning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And, and you guys want to introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Betsy Ayers. And I'm Betty Guerin. All right. And do we have somebody named Jenny on the phone? It's Jenny. Um, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. She's been in our meetings before, and she's applied to be an alternate. Oh, okay. Great. Hey, Jenny. I think you're muted, Jenny. Do you want me to say anything? <laughs> if you like. Did you talk to me? I actually have the TV going too. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> well, so I, I would ask uh, the committee, what would you guys like to do? Well, I'd like to talk about the enforcement issue. Um, and the reason I want to talk about that is because that is the thing that I hear most from people who are not happy about things that happen. Well, okay. A lot of your data indicated that there were very few complaints. And some of the complaints that I know have been called in were not represented in the data. So either the complaint 
someone calls in three times and it only registers as one complaint, which I think is what you said at the last meeting, and people are not getting responses to these complaints. Nobody does anything. No one informs the person who made the complaint. No one, no one gives them any feedback on it, nothing. And I think that unless that issue gets addressed, and so we were gonna have the enforcement officer at the last meeting, and he wasn't hired yet, so we obviously couldn't. Now we're at this meeting, there still is no enforcement officer and no one to even answer questions about the enforcement officer. So, I mean, until we have a meeting where these, where we can address this, to me, it's one of the big critical issues here. Um, because if you have no enforcement, then the rules don't mean a darn thing. And, and I think sometimes, like in my case, they do something, but you don't find out about it. You have to go back and contact them again to find out what's happened. And I'm hoping once we get one person doing it, instead of being shuffled around, that they'll get organized and they'll you know, take your complaint, go deal, do something and send a note out back to you saying, I got your, I got your complaint, I'm working on it, I'm finished it or something. <laughs> the, way it's being, you know, the way it's handled right now is, is, I can't imagine trying to be a police officer doing other things and jumping into complaints as a oh. side, it's kind of a sideline. Right, I agree, it can't, you know, but, I, but so I'm just, I don't know how low on the priority list it is to have an enforcement officer, but it seems like it's pretty low on the priority list. And, and I can understand that because public safety is the most important thing, but I'm just, I, I just don't get it. I don't get what's, why we can't have a meeting with someone to tell us about how that's gonna work or if it's going to work or if it's gonna happen or how it's gonna happen. Because you know, if we have a, a question about a property that we know is listed with an agency, all we have to do is call the agency and they address it. But there are lots of properties that are not listed with agencies and are operating, and I think there are, I don't, wouldn't say a lot, but there's, there's quite a few that are operating illegally. And I don't think that, you know, it's like you send your, your complaint into a void and that's the end of it. Well, you know, I think we, uh, you know, can, we can relay this to the new code official and they're on board and that's, that's why we're here. I mean, you can go over this, uh, Tell them your complaints. We just haven't seen a lot of complaints. So I can tell you, at least from my department, we haven't seen a lot of complaints. So, you know, that's all I can say. And until the code enforcement comes on board, I think you're right. I don't think we're going to answer your questions because I'm the planning department. We're, right. we're doing what we did. We've got, I can show you the short term rental permits. And I don't want to see that again. I've seen it. And that I'm not talking about the people who no, have it's not increasing, you know. Uh, I can update you on seaside, seaside stuff, they're more touring. Uh, they've extended the one for the classic county. Uh, we're you know in the same situation, collecting data for another couple more years. Well, I wanna I would like to ask, why don't we put a moratorium on them while we're studying it? Do I mean I know you said you're watching it. But do you not want to be ahead but, of a curve? But Lynn, why do we need to put a moratorium on something that's not increasing? We're not seeing. Well, that's what I'm asking. If you get 10 applications tomorrow, is it too late to do it then? If we got 10 tomorrow, but we're, we're actually losing. And, okay. You know, I mean, we're, that's, you know, so I, that's the only thing I can tell you. We have less than we when I started. So right. I just don't see that that's a big crisis. I think once you guys, we often hear the complaints, we'll reiterate it, or it's about complaints. And whether those are short-term rental related or whether they're second home related, that's our biggest uh, big. question that's out there. And that's what we'll hopefully collect. Like Lisa said, once we get a code official on board and you guys are assured that your complaints are being heard, you know, well, right, yeah, but right now I'm not seen they've been heard. So until we prove that they're not heard, then you know that's, that's what <laughs> well, I want. And I don't think we have to prove 
that they're not being heard. I think that we need to have somebody to speak to, to find out how they're being addressed because there are people right on this meeting right now who have made complaints and not had them addressed. So I think, you know, uh, at the next meeting, if we don't have a code enforcement officer, is it possible to have Jason at the meeting, even for 10 minutes to answer questions? I think that's up to you guys. <laughs> well, you're, the, you're the one in charge of the meeting. So. I'm not in charge of the meeting. You guys, this is your this is part. <laughs> so, so let me, let me. Okay. <laughs> Jeff, let's have, if we don't have a code enforcement officer, or even if we do, because he's not going to have enough experience. I think having Jason come to the meeting for 10 minutes to answer questions from the committee um, would be very helpful um, because we're not, unfortunately, this committee is not going to get any farther down the road getting things done with the council wants until we get this question answered. Um, it's it's the same, we have the same discussion at the meeting every time. Every time. <laughs> I know. And so, um, it would be great to have Jason here so we could clear it up, figure it out, and move on. Well, now, now we have a quorum. Oh. Hi, guys. Sorry about that. I didn't realize hey, I was a missing link. Hello there. <laughs> so I would say that you guys can call your meeting to, you know, put it in motion if you like. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. I don't know if this is how you do it, but that at the next meeting, if we don't have a code enforcement officer on board, that we have asked Jason to attend our meeting. I know he's very busy. I don't want to take up his time, but if he could give us 10 minutes even to answer some questions and bring the new code enforcement <laughs> with him so that that person who's taking on the job can understand some of the issues that some of us think are important. I second it. All right, all those in favor? Yes. Aye. Oh, we got something done. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's done about not getting something done. <laughs> um, the, the thing I um, that came up yesterday, I guess in coffee with the counselors, and I, I'm not criticizing the police or Jason at all. Our, I know y'all are rewriting the code, but right now the code is written as such, there is no penalty to breaking it really, or, or there's no swift re resolution. It's you get a notice there's something wrong, you have 30 days to respond. And especially in short-term rentals, it's kind of ridiculous. And also the penalties aren't severe enough to if you're renting and, and doing it wrong, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't, they don't feel the penalties because they're making so much money. Who is in charge of rewriting the, that code or have you already done it, Jeff? No, we haven't, we haven't. I mean, well, they, they did rewrite the uh, short-term rental code just about two years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, so yeah, it did just, it was just revised. Uh, and they did revise a, a little bit of the um, of that section of a minor point, but before we couldn't even go after somebody that was uh, doing it that did not have a permit. They they had written the ordinance correct incorrectly. Who, who's capable of making more corrections to it? I, I honestly, I think more of the problem. You know, I think what you're speaking to is. A lot of it has to do with, uh, we have to, it's just like any case, man. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, you can, somebody can, you know, have a problem with that short-term rental, but you also have to collect, uh, their code official will have to collect, uh, you know, te uh, not, uh, evidence that they okay. failed, right? And so uh, they, you know, sometimes that does take more than just, for instance, one party that comes in, it may need another party or two to come in before they can uh, go after them or have the evidence they feel to do that. And okay. so, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I haven't seen, you know, uh, what your, which 
cases you're talking about. And it'd be nice if we had, like you said, the code official here to respond to that. But I know that uh, Robert's worked in code and I've been over code in other jurisdictions, uh, 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 which I'm not here. I'm not over the code official here. But I have yeah, Jeff, but real quick, I, but uh, to validate what she's saying, and if I'm hearing correctly, and you're kind of taking one step back, you know, when it comes to the short-term rental, um, the groups like, you know, like Brian's organization and such, you know, we know that they're following the regulations. What we're talking about, I think, a lot, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, is when somebody who's got their own place is renting, and if we can't change the code to increase the penalty, this might be a crazy idea, but would it be possible that if somebody is renting and they're not part of a, a large group like Brian's, that they have to register the person who's yeah. coming in, even if it's family? Yeah. So yeah, so for or on that, Bob, is that they, they can't get a permit the next year. It's revoked. They can't get it. So, right, but I'm saying if someone's I'm saying if someone's coming this weekend, because what happens is to her point, again, I'm 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 speaking out of turn, but if somebody comes in and you got a problem with somebody who's renting, and then the code enforcement checks into it and they say, Well, it was a family member, if we're forcing the people renting these places who aren't part of a large group to verify ahead of time, like to seek permission, like to register so-and-so is coming this week. And just so you know, that's a tick and tie. So when the court enforcement gets a, a red flag that somebody is not supposed to be there, you can have, you've got verification because they registered them before they arrived. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, we have, they have to have a local rep. And so we can contact the local rep and, and verify that, or the code official does. The local so rep can also be the homeowner itself. No. No, no. Nope. the local okay. rep cannot be the homeowner. And I'd like to clarify a couple of things to Lynn's point. Cool. There cool. is a pretty good bite into people who are renting illegally. If you get caught, there is a substantial fine now that the city can impose. But also that homeowner has the ability to keep their license, but has to come to a management company like cool. Canada Beach Property Management, myself, any one of us to have their property professionally managed. That's a 25 to 35% bite into their income because that's what we, so, those are kind of the parameters. So um, Robert, where did you find this information at? It, I, it was what passed a couple of years ago in the new ordinance. Yeah, okay. That, that's in the ordinance. It's okay, in the I, ordinance. I haven't found that and that's why. I'll talk to you later and, and get some information from yeah, you. Yeah, and so, so that's so that's that and, and to address bob's point i think kind of what we came across the last meeting is we really aren't having problems with professionally managed companies or even or even people that are renting their own other than i know jenny had a problem over in her neighborhood but mostly what's happening is it's the second homeowners that are renting places out in places like Multnomah athletic club that there's no way for us to do it and if I, I'd find it really hard that if, as a second homeowner, somebody's going to go to the city and say, oh, by the way, I've got so-and-so coming to my house this weekend. That's none of the city's business. So it, it's really two well, different yeah, but issues. Brian, not, yeah, but Brian, just, just around that, to that topic, it may not be the city's, uh, it, it actually, in some respect, it, it is, I mean, the city issued the permit allowing them to rent their home. No, their we're talking home. about you're talking about people who don't right. have permits. Uh, Brian. Right. This is all. We're, there's yeah, three. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's yeah, three. That's what I, there's three I categories agree, Bob, with here. The, yeah. You know, I agree with people, Bob on the permitted people, but these are non-permitted people. That they don't have. House, a, they the don't have problem. a license. They're they're under the gotcha, they're gotcha. under the radar completely. Why and so, the well, onus is kind of on how do you prove, you know, to the city that somebody is renting without being licensed. I mean, it's, it seems like for years, there were a lot of the city was losing a tremendous amount of income because they weren't following through on Airbnb listings and double checking to see if those people had licenses uh, and were paying taxes to the city. And I think that I hopefully that's kind of gotten cleaned up because probably your average uh, you know junior in high school who knows how to use a computer could figure that one out pretty quickly. But, uh, you know, how do you, I would think the big issue for code enforcement would be, 
you know, uh, oh, yeah, those are my cousins staying here. Oh, those are my family members staying here. And for people that are residents who are stuck with having this revolving door of people coming and going without a license, without a, a representative like Brian's company, so that I could call up and say, hey, we got a problem here with these people. These are people that are not, they're scofflaws. And uh, the city's not getting the tax money that they're due. And um, I think that that's the issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Wouldn't the whole problem be solved if everyone had to have a license? I mean, had to be registered with an agency if they were going to uh, yeah. rent out their home? I mean, if in, in other words, to, be, to rent out your home as a short-term rental, you have to be registered with an agency. I know that's, you know, and if that was true, then you'd always have somebody to go to, to complain, you know, if, if things weren't being done right. And the agency would, would make sure that there was enforcement, that taxes were being paid, all of those things. Well, you do have that. You have the local representative that you can always uh, go to. And so that is, no, that, the local no. representative is an issue, Jeff, and that's you and I have to talk about it. No, One of the no. things I'd like this group to I, I, take back I, I, to the council is an, is a change to the local rep because I think you need to have, I think we need to require if you're not with a management company or agency, you have to have two local reps because for example, if Betsy had a house and Jenny and Betty was her local rep, but they went on vacation together, who's the local rep then? You know, you have to have somebody there needs to be a backup in the local rep system, which there is not currently, which is where I think some of the problems in that system are. Um, Brian, if they were if they were willing to make a category like that, would you um, take less of a bite if somebody is using you like an, only an emergency basis? They still their local person taking mm -hmm. care of the housekeeping and that kind of stuff. Probably not. Okay. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, and, and I've had people approach me and say, would you be a cleaning service for us? And there's no money in cleaning. I mean, unfortunately I have to pay housekeepers a pretty good living wage and I can't make enough as a cleaning service or a, as a watchdog. And I don't want to be a watchdog. I want to take good care of the owners that want to play on the fair playing field and, and work with, within the, the rules and ordinances of the city. Well, do any of us saying that that's not sorry lisa you're also saying that's not the, the main abuser the main abuser is the second homeowner that's what i'm hearing from the group as well who isn't supposed to be running their place out but is saying quote unquote my cousins are coming are exactly so i'm just gonna make sure i'm clear so lisa i, I don't I, I don't want to interrupt you i just wanted to close the loop on that one question i had is it crazy i mean i, I know when i go out of town i call the police and say hey i'm gonna be out of town for a couple of weeks they actually appreciate knowing that and I know they say, watch, they, you know, they have a squad car come around my home. Is it crazy to, to tell second owners, second homeowners that it's... Um, you're, you're really breaking up there. You're breaking up, Bob. Other than you is in your home, we would ask you to just inform us. Brother, I'm trying to... Sorry, it came over the past, but at least better. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think the police or anybody wants to have that kind of responsibility, and it is really intrusive. Lisa, I, I think uh, your idea of having everybody who has a short-term rental license in town have to go through a professional company is something that should be really explored. Because then it's, pre then it's pretty clear, because you just go next door mm -hmm. and you say... Uh, so, uh, you know, to the rent to these people, you know, oh, uh, you know, who are you renting this through? And if they say, oh, we're just renting it through the owner, then you could say, well, you know, actually we have an ordinance in town that that uh, person needs to be going through one of the professional companies and have a license. I agree. I think it's something to really think about. Um, and I maybe if, I don't know if this committee would be willing to make that as a recommendation, we probably have to talk about it a lot more, but I think it's definitely something to consider going back to the council with a recommendation to do something like that. It won't take care of the person who's just going to cheat no matter what, you know, who's going to, I mean, they're always going to have those people. They exist in every facet of society. There's not much you can do about that, except for the neighbors to, you know, keep an eye out and report them and have a code enforcement officer who really responds to those complaints. You know, that's how you catch or get the people who are just 
you know, cheating on the system. Um, and maybe if there was a code enforcement officer who really was active in responding to those complaints, people would be less inclined to do it because they don't want to, you know, no one wants to have, you know, a, a huge fine or a court case or whatever. Oh, know. I, I, I know a house on the, on a street in Cannon Beach that she sold. I'm glad, but was the code enforcement's police departments in cities nightmare for years and years because she really didn't care. I mean, she she <laughs> broke the rules all the time. Um, believe me, I was glad to see her house sell. Um, it, it, it's tough. And it is that second homeowner, like I've said before, that, you know, they don't, I don't know that they really care. We, there's a bunch of people that are, feel entitled to do some of those things. Well, if they're renting their place for $600 a night, that's true. Then a, a, a fine, you know, getting is just a slap, a small fine is a slap on the wrist. Right. It isn't going to be enough to deter them from, you have to make the fines as somebody just said here, you have to, I think it was Lynn, you have to make those fines significant enough that they're losing, losing their profit. <laughs> well, yes, I agree. I mean, we're in the middle of doing the audit right now. So we can, because we have to turn in an audit every year that shows every house that we manage in Canada Beach and what those stays were not necessarily the people that stayed there but what the length of stays in those were so and that they comply they comply with the 14 day license or they comply with with the grandfathered or the five year yeah so you guys we turned off our video uh, and people are still breaking up their audio so um just i don't know if anybody else is having that problem but um just thought i'd say that yeah okay now, I think Bob had said that he was coming over a pass or something. Uh, you know, that's, I think that's what they said. He said I, I heard him, I heard him say that, but, but Brian was breaking up and Lisa was breaking up. So it's not just someone driving over the, the pass yeah. at the moment. He's, he's actually dropped off period. So uh, I, I see that. I can hear everyone fine. So can I. Except for the except for the past person. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't expect to. Brian, I have a question. I know you guys are going through the audit. So what about like my neighbor who had a short term rental license, uh, rented through Airbnb? Does she have to turn that in? How does that work? She has to she has to comply with the audit as well. Because she had a short anybody with a short term license that's licensed in the city has to participate in the audit. And so would she fill out that paperwork herself or would Airbnb fill it out she for would, her? She is responsible to fill that out. All Airbnb is, is advertising. the best way to say what Airbnb is, it's like Safeway. You know, you go into Airbnb, you go into Safeway and you buy Cheerios and they have a, any number of products that you can buy. Airbnb is the same thing. They're just a storefront right. for a lack of better terms that provides an inventory for people to buy. Um, they are, they do collect taxes from the state of Oregon. They do not collect taxes for Classic County or the city of Canada Beach. So we are responsible for all those taxes through Airbnb to still remit those to the city. Um, but Airbnb is just, uh, for lack of better terms, right. a store provider. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hate to be thought of as a one topic person and I'm kind of <laughs> over my neighbor's problem there, but um, certainly I feel like I did everything right. I took pictures of every car every time I texted Travis and I think she did get one $200 fine. Um, but since she was renting for over $600 a night on the east side of a highway in a manufactured home, that was nothing to her. <laughs> Yeah, I think though, it, like you said, uh, uh, Jenny, that uh, when she goes through her audit, we'll see on the violations. It will she could be, uh, you know, fined for more than that and may lose her license. Well, it'll be interesting if she if she turns in a true picture of her renters. Yeah, what makes you think she'd even she declare more than maybe twenty five percent of her renters? Why would she do that? She knows what she's doing. She knows it's not. Right. Why would she bother saying, hey, I'm guilty, man, find me. <laughs> you know? 
it's not a perfect system, unfortunately, because those who want, as we all know in this world, those who want to get around it will get around it. And it doesn't matter what amount of code enforcement, what amount of things. Um, we've we've let owners go before because they haven't played by the, you know, they right. wanted to play by the, not play by the rules. Um, and they've gone to other companies and they are playing by the rules now once they found out that that's the rule here. You know, people are not going to slide. Um, so. All right. What else do we have to discuss? I see policy update, regional short-term policy changes, code audit process, and affordable workforce housing. Yeah, I just, I gave you the update. Seaside has uh, uh, decided not to put on a moratorium. Uh, they, do have a, they did hire a code official or a, what they termed it something else, but that's what they're, they've kind of invested in the code official front. Uh, then we've got CLASIP who has extended their, their emergency uh, or their moratorium will end in April, I believe. And so uh, they've got some changes that they just put up there. I, I think January 22nd was the, the last date that I saw on that. And they've got those up on their website of their proposed changes. Um, not, not many uh, changes to their ordinance. So I think they're considering possibly like Arch Cape, a special area for Arch Cape. And so. Well, I think that's one of the reasons, Jeff, they put a moratorium is the county actually had two sets of rules. They had the Arch Cape rules and they had the, the county at large for better, unincorporated class of county rules. And I think because of the confusion between the two, they're trying to bring it in so everything is under one class of county ordinance. Anything yes. unincorporated? Or, I mean, it doesn't affect Kent. It's not, the cities have their own, but that's outside the city limits. Right, it's outside the city limits. So, so an example of that, Lynn, is we manage three homes um, that if you, one of them would be considered, if you looked at it, you go, oh, well, that's in Cannon Beach. It's not, it's up <laughs> on Seascape and it's actually in the county. Okay. Um, so it falls under county. So I've got another one by Silver Point that falls into county. Um, so those are the, those are the ones they're looking at. Arch Cape is a, a special overlay zone though. So, and up until now, they've been allowed to make their own rules up to a point about right. things like that. So, and so that's why the county's trying to bring it, marry the two groups to, so the rules are easier to, the county has a hard, just as hard a time enforcing rules as the city of Cannon Beach does. <laughs> and they've got a larger area with, you know, with one person. So that's what they're trying to, they're actually trying to not overburden themselves with rules so they, that they can't enforce was one of the things I saw. So. Yeah. Same with me. <laughs> uh, so the uh, other thing is, uh, yeah, on the workforce housing, affordable housing front, we've had conversations with the city council. Uh, they're, I think, interested in moving that topic forward this year. And so I've had Brandon and I uh, met one of our city councilors. We met with uh, one of the city of Seaside's uh, council members and to the planner to discuss that. And then we have a meeting set up with uh, Class of County and one of their um, commissioners and planners. And we've met with the, um, also the planners, the regional planners. And so uh, we're trying to uh, get the, uh, a regional meeting uh, of our elected officials and hopefully in the next few months on that. So that's our, next steps on that and working on that. So. Jeff, did, wasn't there just a meeting last week, a uh, council meeting in Astoria, the old Safeway site that's right downtown Astoria, and they were talking about making it into um, workforce housing and slash uh, uh, substance abuse recovery center, like mm -hmm. combining the two in one building. And then there was a bunch of people who were furious about that and wanted to see it turned into a park instead. 
And do you know what came of that meeting? Do you have any idea? I think if you're talking about the Heritage Square project, that's, yeah. a, uh, that's an affordable housing and- uh, Oh, it's not workforce, okay. Can I ask a question? And it's been asked many times. Define workforce for me and define affordable for me. Okay, so- Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> we just did a presentation that, well, you can pull up that presentation when we did on the city council. It's got the definitions there. Affordable housing is a, a HUD term, a federal term about a percentage of uh, median income and where you fit within that median income so that they can give federal funding to uh, homes that reach certain levels of, of median income. Workforce housing is more of a local term and that's usually by a jurisdiction such as a city or county often combined where they say, we're trying to provide housing for our workforce. So our public workers, us, uh, uh, police, fire, those folks. And so those folks like us would sign up for these programs that through a housing authority usually, and then they're on these waiting lists for apartments built specifically for those. So it's, it's creating a secondary market, usually through deed restricted rentals and ownership uh, opportunities. And so it's a way for mountain towns have been doing this for 30, 40 years, other areas that do it, resort areas of, around the country. And they do this to, uh, for, uh, you know, with the goal of uh, 15, 20, 25% of their housing that they build will be protected for their workforce. Isn't that what Skylark is, is workforce housing? Mm -hmm. Uh, not, not really. It's, it's, it's somewhere in between. I mean, they built okay. it themselves. So that's a private, it's, it's somewhat like that, but we have nothing saying that it's reserved for certain ones. They're doing right. it because they built a uh, coaster because their, their workforce need, they needed their workforce. Right. Payments, you know? I thought their applications though required you to be employed. With, with, with the, the sky. I think they do. They, they require you to be employed in Cannon Beach. You're not retired. You're not on public assistance. You have to be employed. Right. Yeah, yeah. But doesn't that have a 10-year moratorium? After 10 years, it yeah. can be just turned over to just being regular rentals. Right, yeah. exactly. And we've seen that happen before, I think, up on the road up the hill to Elk Creek Road. There were condominiums built for workforce housing, and now they've all been sold. I mean, yes. It's been 15 years ago. Can we ever build something and say you can never ever sell it or never ever change the status of it? Sure. With deed restrictions, you can. Yeah. Absolutely. But, okay. But how do you apply deed restriction? How, how can you say to one person, this is your deed restriction, and the next person comes up and you don't make them do the same thing? So different communities do it different ways, you know. Um, you know, I, I, for instance, I worked in a community where they gave you three. Op you could, if you're building new air, uh, any kind of new square footage or whatever, uh, certain areas make you pay an in lieu of fee. That in lieu of fee goes to build affordable housing units or workforce housing units. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an in lieu of fee uh, way. The second is that. If you're building 10 new units, then two, two, two of them, 20%, have to be workforce housing and they go to that program. Uh, that's on site. Off site delivery would be oh, I'm going to build 10 units here, but I'll provide two more somewhere else. And so there's different techniques. So that's some of the ones, but that's how they work in different areas. Do we always already have that in our code? No, we collect 1% of construction excise tax for uh, going to affordable housing. And so we've got about 250,000 currently that we've collected uh, that's going unused, that, that could be used in some fashion. Uh, and so that's the goal is to start talking about this regionally because most that work well are regional because 
as you know, most of our workforce will, even if we would provide them here, wouldn't want to live here or they couldn't live here. And so we can build the units elsewhere much cheaper and, and probably closer to some of their needs uh, than we could here. So we need to start thinking regionally of how we do these things. And so the, dirt's too, the dirt's too expensive here to build workforce housing. Exactly. Right. Who is who is doing this, Jeff? Is someone actively pursuing this? Well, I am. I'm, I'm okay. pursuing it with Brandon from our city council. Okay. And so we're starting those conversations across the region, and we hope to, you know, bring a regional um, elected official from every region sit down together and start talking about uh, how they want to uh, solve this. So, Jeff, I didn't. I, I think there was an interruption about you were talking about Heritage Square. Mm -hmm. What happened with that? So, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. You know, you are you talking about what happened the last meeting? I don't know. I just know that project. I, I didn't hear what happened. This, uh, oh, so. they were arguing about it. Yeah, I can look at that. Yeah, what I've what I've read, Lisa, is they're still they're still up in the air. There's a lot of people that are concerned that it's that it is in the middle of downtown and takes away needed parking. People think it's great for downtown. I, I think they're still in the battle of trying to figure out what they want to do with the big hole in the ground. Yeah, it's going to be quite a battle. Yes. Because they said that if they put a park there, they're just going to attract a, a homeless encampment essentially is what they're worried about. And, and I don't know, it, yeah, it's a tough question. Well, it's like here, we, we have this, we've had this discussion and I, I remember a couple of years ago when they were talking of putting, you know, tiny homes over in part of the RV park. And, and uh, one of my former teachers and a friend of mine was, who is very much for doing things was like, nope, not over in my neighborhood. I don't want that there. And, and that's one of the big problems is, is none of us want, you know, everybody's like, well, I don't want it in my neighborhood. I want it someplace else. Um, you know, I think Cannon Beach looking at ADUs and putting a restriction on them that says they can never become a short-term rental and they are used for that. Um, I live out on Highway 26. I've got a spot. I wish the county would let me put an ADU in and I'd rent it to one of my employees at a reduced rate because I have space for it. I'm not allowed to do that. Um, that, that was one of my, you know, I, I suggested a three-prong attack. That's the number one leg on my three-prong attack is exactly what he just said to take that planning commission and start that through the process. But it fell on deaf ears. I haven't heard anything from the city council. Yeah, how I think. People, how many people have room for an ADU on their lot in in Cannon Beach? I mean, maybe outside of. I mean, I'm I'm not downtown, but I'm I'm behind the month. I don't have room to put an ADU on a, on my property. Well, a lot of people do, and okay. a lot of people a lot of people. Well, I mean, we see them all the time, and we got one this week. So. I mean, we, we, there's a lot to do, and, and you honestly, you don't have to. In well, most jurisdictions, you don't have to build a new ADU. Some will allow you to convert part of your space into an ADU. So there's plenty of opportunities for mother in law suites and things like that. Uh, it's just how much, how much uh, people want to solve this problem or not. And quite frankly, I just, I don't know. I think there's a lot of talk, I just haven't seen a lot of action. <laughs> I've been here for years. We have built none. I, I I was told you could not rent out a room in your house because you know we have seasonal kids come in, the bike boys maybe, or the a trap people. And I was told you're not allowed to rent a room and a bathroom to anyone for less than thirty days. Yeah, for less than for a short term rental, you can't. But you can oh. long term. I don't know of any. For like a summer, it would be okay. Yeah, I don't know of okay. anything, Lynn, that would would. Okay. prohibit you from doing that we don't we're we can, we're not allowed to regulate that, that kind of thing is from my understanding okay everything anything over 30 days lynn there's the city has no really as far as i know jeff has no jurisdiction do they if I mean, right. yeah not so that, unless it's like a fire or safety type of thing right right as long as there's egress smoke detectors co it, it fits safety requirements yeah it would require an inspection by the fire yeah. department, probably. No, okay. 
No, we don't even do that. You know, I have worked in many jurisdictions that would require that, but we don't. So, all right. Well, that, I mean, some of us have houses that would, could adapt to that, and some don't. And so I would propose that um, maybe next meeting, like you said, Lisa, I will ask, walk over right now and ask the chief to be there, okay? If, if the code official's not gonna be there, he better be there. The <laughs> second thing for that meeting is I would request that you guys at least talk about having a chair and talk about that kind of thing. Because <coughs> I, I really think you're at a point where you know, you guys can start taking the lead on some of this, especially if we have that code official, I think we'll have the team to kind of move your concerns forward. So uh, we'll have new, uh, on that note, we will have the new code audit information. So we can compare at least, this will be the first time since I can recall that we can compare audits and see how the numbers are compared uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID and then, um, also, you know, I'll give you the update. I'll provide the presentation that I was going to give, but we'll just update that into the new one. I want to do it, and once we have the uh, code official on board. Okay. Sounds so cool. I'm going to put election of officers on the next agenda, just so that Lynn can say that the agenda changed. Oh yay! This. <laughs> um. This this is an unpleasant topic for me to bring up. But we've got some people on this committee that don't attend meetings, and I know things come up, but we've had people not been here all year. At what time do we look for replacements? Yeah, we can look. Um, I'm thinking that... I, I, just, I simply don't want us to gel as a group and work together as a group, and then we come up with ideas and people that haven't been participating come in and say, oh, no, we don't like this. I'd like for everybody to be in one ball. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to talk about when you guys elect your chair and everything. And it's a good thing to just to kind of like the eyeballs. Or don't elect a chair. Yeah, or don't, yep. Yeah, because I, I, I think this works really well. I mean, I, I like it that, that, that it's just, you know, that it's an open-ended discussion. I think that's great. Is that a motion, Lisa? Is that a motion you're making? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I, I do think that because we were tasked with coming to the council with some, some recommendations, we do need after two years to start looking at some things oh, yeah. that, that to move forward. I know the council, I at least read through the notes or heard that they were frustrated at their work session or their retreat that we didn't have anything to present to them yet. Um, so I think there's some things we, we need to start moving in that direction. I think Lisa getting the code enforcement officer in, find out, and I do believe we need the chief there because I don't believe the code enforcement officer is gonna have enough time under their belt as code enforcement officer to answer the questions you are gonna wanna answer. So I think if we could have him and the chief, so the chief can answer some of the tougher questions that the code enforcement officer is going to be brand new. And as all of us know, when we're brand new in things, we don't have all the answers. So, uh, Brian, I would agree. And I'd also add that we talked about this in a couple of the meetings that, you know, having a task list of this is what we need to accomplish at the meeting, not just here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what, here's answers we need either at this meeting or the next has been really important. And from, right. and having a chair or not a chair, I like the fact that <coughs> Jeff, who represents the city, is kind of facilitating the meeting and kind of letting the dynamic flow. So I, like Lisa, would agree or at least think that a chair doesn't necessarily make sense, at least for me either. But I do think that if the council wants answers and wants some recommendations, then if Jeff could help direct us as far as what we need to be deciding in how many days and when, give us some deadlines so that we can get that in there, get them voted on and find out what we're missing in the way of data so that we can be more productive. And I think that was the meeting we had a couple of times ago, I think two ago, when Jeff had to leave early and we all talked amongst ourselves. So it's not that we're afraid to talk in front of Jeff. I certainly am not, but I think <laughs> the task list would certainly help. And yeah, as I understood it, the, re the reason this came about was trying to decide if the 
unlimited rental should be allowed to continue. And that's so why. If you look at the, uh, the mission and uh, it's on the back of your agenda every time. And so you'll see that you've got your, what the mission and then kind of the scope of work for you guys is on there. That's, that's what they agreed to the city council. So, and you can, you know, I'm happy to give you the staff reports and minutes from what they decided or the meetings, or you can go back and watch them. But I don't think it was strictly to say that it was made. How's this program working? And that's it. You know, right. that's kind of your general guideline. How's the program working? Does it need any changes, any uh, updates or, or, you know, so I think you guys got a pretty good broad range of what you guys want to look at. And I agree with Brian, Lisa, all of you guys, uh, and, and that you don't have to have a chair and that you guys can go, <coughs> but, you know, uh, I do think you need to probably start getting those, uh, you know, I think Lisa mentioned one recommendation, uh, Brian mentioned another, start just putting those recommendations together so that you start talking about them, you know, uh, in a kind of cohesive fashion. And maybe we do bring after, like Brian said, it's been two years now. And so maybe we should target uh, bringing something to them, you know, by the third year at least. And then that gives you one more year of at least of being a, a, a with your charge that they you could come back and make uh, any kind of recommendations or uh, ordinance changes. Yeah, but on, but on, Jeff, if I may, but on that note, and I appreciate what you're saying. What I'm hearing, if I'm hearing correctly from everybody, is is we, you know, when I hear we're two years in, another year to go, it, it just sounds like the long process that is government. And if you know, if you're facilitating is it reasonable to ask you to say, listen, at the next meeting, here's the things that you guys have talked about. We need to either make a motion and vote on them and get them in front of the council, or here's what we're looking to get accomplished. Because yes, we talk about a lot of stuff and we get a lot of information from you, which I appreciate. But when it comes down to it, there's a list of needs and we have to either agree that it's broken and what are the points we wanna move forward or it's not broken and make the recommendation of the city. I don't think any of us is thinking that it's not broken, but that task list, which many of us are driven by with very specifics that you generate, will get this accomplished and maybe even under that year. It doesn't have to be a three-year commitment if we can get it done before. Does anybody, does, does anybody agree or disagree with that? I agree. I, I believe, Bob, that there's certain things. I know, I know there's people, well, this is before Katie and Jeff that found the 14-D license to be very cumbersome. There were a lot of violations basically because people were on their own didn't understand it. So it's like, does that 14 day get changed? I have some real interesting ideas about that. I also, I'm <laughs> one that believes that, but I also believe that taking areas like where Jenny lives and Haystack Heights, maybe those areas become zones where those that have vacation rentals now are fine until they, they're, they kind of age out or they sell in there. And those are areas that don't have vacation rentals in them. Um, I think one of the misconceptions is, is that us that have agencies want vacation rentals everywhere. That's not necessarily true. Actually, right. I just turned another one down up in Haystack Heights that I don't want to have. Um, so, so I think there's some things that we need to look at. Is the 14 day license working? Could it be tweaked a little bit? Um, is the five year program, is it benefiting being gone or should it come back? because it was put on a moratorium it wasn't gotten rid of. Mm -hmm. so those are some of the things that i think taking a look at do we require signage on all vacation rooms there's supposed because, to you know all of ours except for a couple have signage on mm -hmm. well um, and brian to that point and and, and not to that we need to comment each one of the points you made right. Right at this moment or though we can I think it would behoove us if someone like yourself, at least behoove me anyway, if you would, you know, get yourself on the agenda to present, I have some points I'd like to have a vote on, um, make your case on those points, and then we move on, and then we've got some documentation. I, I just feel that everybody's very busy, and I have, like everybody, have made the commitment to be on this, this committee as long as we need to, but I do feel that sometimes I leave the meetings feeling like, hmm, I'm not really sure what we all agreed on or didn't agree on. It seemed like there's a lot of commentary. And then it's three months later, I feel like some of me, part of me has to get caught back up before I can be productive in the meeting. So right. it would help if, 
If people have ideas or things that they would like to be voted on, make your case. And whoever's there to what was made earlier, if someone's missing the meeting and they miss, they miss. They can't come back to it. They're done um, as far as the voting goes anyway. But I just feel we would all be more productive if we knew that there's going to be a presentation, we're going to vote on it, and we can have dialogue around it. Similar to what the council does, but it, it is an effective way to get it done sooner than later, we hope. I'd agree. Well, I, I think that one of the things that we can think about for next time, and I would ask everyone to think about it, is the idea of all short-term rentals being hooked up with an agency. I think that's an idea that we should seriously think about. And what I'm hearing is the things we're worried about don't align with the scope of work we were given. I mean, the scope of work is, are they, you know, we're supposed to research if they're geographically concentrated um, are they related, duration of use related? Um, is there traffic or parking? You know, the, the list that's on the back of our piece of paper really aren't the things that we're finding that we know are problems. I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about other things other than this, these five, five things on our, on our piece of paper. They're all related. Right. They're all related because that's why people are upset about some people are upset about short-term rentals in the neighborhood because of those things that you listed. So I think it's all related. Yeah, but I'm, I guess in my mind, I'm, I'm going, okay, let's look at A, answer that question, answer B. And it's more of a mash it all together thing. We're not going down a specific list. We're finding what's related to it and answering it. Because and I don't disagree. And I, and, I, and I think what Lisa says is also correct. I think that you know, you can't help but go down this rabbit hole and realize that it goes left, it goes right, it goes straight, um, and it is all related. And although we have to get through the rabbit hole and answer those questions, we still need to at least identify and address whether council or Jeff thinks we need to address them as part of our scope or that they're at least mentioned and should be dealt with by somebody, whether council or somebody else. And, and I'd like to say one of the things I think did come out of this group over the last, starting from two years ago to this point, is there is now an understanding in this group that there is a difference, and there wasn't this understanding when we started, there is a difference, understanding there's a difference between short-term rentals and second homeowners who do not comply, hmm, yes. which, is, which is a huge piece to understand as we go forward in looking at the ordinance. I did hear yesterday at some meeting I was in, um, I guess it was coffee with the counselors, people talking about the, how many rentals there are in a, in a specific area. And I know, I think Seaside has some limitations. So Thank I you. think that's something we need to look into is, um, I, I like the idea, you know, see a high stack heights, you know, if y'all want to section that off as that's local only. But I also think we ought to look at, make sure a street doesn't wind up all but one house as a rental. I think density of rentals are, is something to address. And I, and I think, and Len, I agree with you. I think one of the things you have to be careful of, and one of the things that's always been my concern in that, mm -hmm. is that when you have a, a street that is, unfortunately, there's no control over second homes. So you could take Adams, for example, and say, okay, you can only have five rentals on Adams, the entire length of it from the beach to the highway. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't mean you can't have second homes on. One of my concerns always is, is dark streets in the middle of winter in Cannon Beach. Because we have so many second homeowners, you can go down some of these streets and there's nobody on those streets for weeks on it. Because they're second homeowners who aren't coming over, over the pass in the winter, they, they got other things, you know, they're skiing on Mount Hood. So all of a sudden you've got a street like Adams that's black as far as lights and activity. And the minute you do that, that invites criminals and crime. Because if there's no traffic on it, that's really easy to get in and out. Of. And the advantage of having the 14-day license with the short-term rentals is you've got activities on those streets, which makes them look lived in. And I know that's not a popular way to look <laughs> at it, but if you have activity, you have less crime. 
So we should encourage that every block have one 14 day rental at least. <laughs> well, at That's least some, I mean, the, 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 the problem is, is that you, tr yeah. well, number one, it's better for houses to have people in and out of them because it's healthier for houses. They don't like being empty. That's where mold issues and rodent issues and everything happen when you have empty. I mean, I could tell you a story about a house on Brelier that had a hot water tank burst. And because of the snow and everything, it was a second home. It sat empty for three months and the heat came back on with oh. a hot water tank that burst. So they had to take that house down to the studs to redo it. So there are some advantages to some short-term rentals. I don't disagree with making, limiting the number. A density issue, you know, Manzanita does. I think their their issue is only 14 or 15 percent. Jeff may know better. Of those homes, can their inventory can be vacation rentals? Yeah, 13 percent, but you know, uh, we're not even close. Right, but I mean, but that's but Manzanita has a waiting list now because they are they actually have more vacation rentals than we do. Yeah. Um, but they have a, a they can only have 13 to 15% of their in home inventory can be short-term rentals. So, and we're only at, I think, 10 or 11% are short-term rentals. Yeah, even less than that. Yeah. Uh, there's but I agree, Bob, that we need to come with some ideas and, and I'm more than willing to bring some of mine to the next meeting and, <coughs> and kind of state my point. And if people agree, they agree. And if they don't, we move on. Well, and again, I say that only in the context of, um, it, you know, and, and I've heard it from a lot of people, not just today, that um, some of this is a bit of information gathering, clearly, but with the gap in time from meeting to meeting, um, it feels like we're just not getting the traction. Um, I, I wonder, and I'm not suggesting this, but I'm just making the point, if this was a three-month committee that met weekly, we would have been done by now, probably. Not, granted, without code enforcement, et cetera, I'm just, I'm being a little dramatic in the statement. But I think the length of time is also making it take that much time. Well, I, I don't think we have the information. I, I don't agree with that because I think it's been, there's been a, I mean, we've had charts and graphs, but we haven't had some hardcore information that we, that we need to make any kind of assessment. And, and one of the big things is the code enforcement piece. So. Couldn't agree more. Until we have that, I just don't see how we can proceed. Lisa, so do you think that, do, hold real quick though, Lisa, do you no, think no. that having that code enforcement officer, when we do have that somebody that consists in somebody, um, are we, um, or are you suggesting, or are we suggesting that we set criteria as far as what they are looking for from our recommendations, as opposed to just doing their job and reporting back? Are we giving them tasks? <laughs> We do have a, it's two basically is going to have to be with them. Um, is Cannon Beach seeing an increase in influence complaints that is directly code related um, mm -hmm. on our agenda, I guess it's our, our scope of work. So they're going to have to be involved in that if nothing else. If the complaints aren't registered, what's, oh, that's true. what good is that going to do? In other words, we can't answer that question because I know there are complaints that have not been registered that don't show up on the statistics. So, and mainly that's because they might be one address with five complaints shows up as one complaint on the statistics. Really? Yes. That's not the one recommendation you might make from what you're saying is that a complaint is a complaint and numerically should be counted independent of how many complaints per address. Oh, absolutely. And I would agree hundred percent. And there is something that we should be not only um, recommending, but be voting on and bring it to council so that we can change how the code enforcement works. So yeah. it is answering the question I asked, which is, are we ultimately hopefully dictating what our strong recommendation is as far as how enforcement should be going forward? I think so. I think good. yes, we are. Okay, good. Whether, whether anyone will listen to us is another matter, but I think we can definitely <laughs> make those recommendations. Good. Well, and by this time next year, <laughs> when we go to do recommendations, we're going to have a whole new council and a new mayor. So that's true. Oh, yeah. <coughs> All right. Yeah. yeah so um, uh, 
uh, if you guys want to send me your recommendations or Brian, if you want to kind of uh, maybe you and I can meet and maybe if you want to do that. No, uh, I, 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 no, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think we should have one member of this committee meeting with you with their recommendations. Okay. I think it should be open and if, all of us should have input into whatever I'm, recommendation. I'm saying for him to whatever he wants to get to me, if you'd like to do it too, Lisa, we can whatever. If you I think recommendations. Lisa, I think what Jeff's trying to do is get, so it's on the agenda, understand what the recommendation is and bring it to the committee, the work, the, the group, so the group can talk about it. I would never want it to go to just Jeff and Jeff and I talk about it. If I bring it to Jeff, this is what I'm looking at. Let's put this on the agenda. Let's talk about it. Well, there's two things on the agenda that from our discussion right now that we just came up with. Code enforcement. Code everybody enforcement. Should rep, everybody should be rep by an agency. And do we need to look at density of rentals? I got three. Right. That's three things that are on the agenda that are big issues. I appreciate that. I would like to add to that or dig in to, I'd like uh, if Jason's the one who's coming next time, to walk us through the blueprint of how the code enforcement relative to this subject works so that we can review it from his perspective and make those recommendations with him in the room. And if he's got any um, challenges to that, he can tell us why it wouldn't work so we can discuss it and vote on it and move on. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that's actually what was on the agenda for today. But uh, like you said, there was no code official stuff. So. Okay, so that's four yeah. things. Four, good, four, four things then, correct. Uh, I will send Jeff a note with those four things to put on the agenda. How does that sound? That Perfect. Good. Perfect. I'm being useful. You are. Lynn, you're always useful. Always, yes. Um, we might also add tonight at the city council meeting, they're going to um, put some more people on our committee. Or the, they're the alternates, correct? Alternates, yeah. <coughs> And then to uh, tomorrow night is the uh, second of the joint uh, work sessions for the uh, code audit. So let me ask a question though before we adjourn. If there, if council is going to be adding new people to our committee, back to the original comment about if people aren't attending, they should be off. And I couldn't agree more too. <clears throat> but as we're trying to vote and get things done, I'm just bringing up the challenge somebody who joins us next time who has no history and maybe not have read through everything we've done, are they gonna start delaying the progress and how do we work through that or around that? Well, I understand that they're just, they're alternates, number one. They're alternates. And, and I'm okay. also hoping that the council would pick people who have been paying attention. I actually wrote a letter to the council about that for, for tonight's meeting about, you know, uh, picking alternates and who, you know, people who've expressed an interest and been, and been paying attention and how important it is that it's somebody that there's equal representation on this committee, not just members of the business community and people who are invested in short-term rentals. And, um, you know, so I, that I, like, for example, Lisa Frazier was the other person who I was sort of, you know, who was not invested as a short-term rental owner, but she's gone now. So, uh, so Jeff, who are the alternates? Can you share with us who's applied for those? Uh, it's on the, uh, I don't have them. Uh, okay. on. It's on the, they're Jenny, on the they're Jenny on the, has, and I, I think Jenny would be great to be as, as an right. alternate. Yeah, because yeah. she's, <laughs> she's got some history here. Yeah. Well, also Elena Gregaire put in for it, and um, someone who lives down by you, Bob, on Chisana, but I don't remember his name. And <laughs> someone who start whose whose mother started one of the rent the the uh, short term rental agencies whose daughter runs one, I think. Right. Now. So. So that'd be Tammy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's her mother. Oh, it's it's. We'll see, and and if it if it's her mother, there's a lot of history and a lot of knowledge with her. Um, Jean Williams and Dorian Farrow. Jean Williams knows more about short-term rentals in this town than anybody on this committee. 
Yeah, she's but been... we have you as a representative. We got Brian. What do we need her for? Yeah. Well, but I don't I, think I, we need another person who's in the short-term rental business on the. Community. I'm not saying there should be. I'm just saying that those those people that we're looking at, Jenny's would be a great one to have. Gene would be good. Gene is is not in the business anymore. But she her sold daughter. her business. Hmm? <laughs> her daughter. But that, I can tell you, my dad was a pharmacist for years and I didn't always agree with him on things. No, but people, <laughs> so, are not, no, people are not going to make decisions against their own children's interests. I'm sorry. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. People will do that. <laughs> I, I've had family make decisions against my interests. So I under, I, I've seen it happen. Yeah, let me introduce you to my parents. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but um, one last thing, again, going back to the topics that have been brought up, the four things for next item. Um, is it um, realistic that if anybody has an item that they would like addressed and can present to it, can be added to the agenda without meeting with Jeff? Can we just email everybody that I'm looking to add these to the, to the item? I think that's a great idea. Uh, email it to me, and I put it on the agenda. Uh, right. Okay. Okay, that's how these usually work, and I just put out the agendas. Yeah. Right. Doesn't have any kind of, but yeah, you don't have a uh, chair or something, but you can always send it to me. I'll collate them and put them out there. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Great. All right. And if you guys also, if you have information that you want me to put up or, or get out, uh, do that as well. So, you know, if you got, uh, you know, recommendations and you got some information that you want to attach to it, uh, please get that to me as well before I put the agenda out. We try to get we'll try to get the agenda out at least a week uh, a week prior. And so, if you can get it to me before, that'd be great. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I, have, I have a, a a question. I don't know where I went. Um, here I am. Uh, does anybody want to meet more often or not? Three months is a long time for me to remember anything. Um. I know people are busier than I am, but that, that's just a question, you know, is once a month too often for us to meet? Oh, definitely. I mean, for okay. me, that's, that's I, I mean. I, that's, you know, I'm in a different boat. I feel like I'm in a, a meeting, you know, every twice, night, twice a week now. Okay. Already. Yeah. This is but my to your point. Day, and so. and I, I couldn't do it either. And it sounds like, I don't think Brian, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but to your point, it's what I was trying to bring up earlier is it is a lot to try to regroup after three months and, and kind of recalibrate everything. But if we knew, like Jeff's about to do, that this is what we're voting on, or this is what's going to be brought up and we're probably going to vote on it, uh, gives everybody a chance to review the information so that at least relative to what's going to be talked about, we can get moving and traction on. I feel good about that. Does everybody feel good about that? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, you know... You know uh, I think that once you guys and then over the next couple of meetings, like you said, uh, because honestly, when they, you can go back and listen to it, they really, it was going to four year term and you guys, it's really about gathering data for most of that time. And so, you know, I don't think they, they may expect an update on how things are going at the retreat, but I don't think they're wanting you guys to just barrage them with things. I think it's more of, okay, when you guys get your, uh, everybody that's happy with the recommendations and you've got data to back you up, that's when you bring it forward. And like you said, if you don't feel you have the data with the code of complaint official yet, then I, you know, I think you're going to take a couple more meetings. So until you hit that threshold, which probably been a couple more meetings, then if it comes that you've got your list of recommendations stuff and you guys want to meet monthly once or twice, then that might be a time to do that. Okay, I would agree. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank right. you, everybody. Great okay. feedback. Bye-bye.